This time last year, the Seahawks surprised many by drafting a quarterback with a fifth overall pick. Could it be deja vu with another secondary playmaker coming in the first round? We'll be taking a look at the latest prospect to visit the VMAC for a top 30 visit here on our Monday edition of Locked On Seahawks. You are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, 12. This is Corbin Smith, host of the Locked On Seahawks Podcast, your daily Seahawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Glad to be joined, as always, by my co-host and crime, Rob Rang. And a special thanks to each and every one of the 12s tuning in. Thank you for making Locked On Seahawks your first listen five days a week. Whether you're tuning in from Bremerton, Washington, or St. Louis, Missouri. We are getting close to one week away from the NFL draft. A certain playmaking secondary player visited the VMAC today. We're going to be discussing what that may mean for the Seahawks in the first round coming up later this month. Plus, we are going to take a deep dive into this year's tackle class with day three options that could be depth pieces for the Seahawks and much more. This episode is brought to you away by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, bucks, win or lose. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Now for your lead story here on our latest Mock Draft Monday here on Locked On Seahawks. This time a year ago, Devin Witherspoon was visiting the Seahawks at the VMAC for one of their final top 30 visits. And then less than two weeks later, Seattle tabbed him as their fifth overall selection. It surprised many, certainly not us. It was something that we discussed as a real possibility a year ago. And here we are now in 2024, a new coaching staff, under Mike McDonald, who is looking for as many pieces that he can add on this defense to get this group playing back at the level that they expect to play. And it's interesting that Cooper DeGene, the quarterback, maybe safety in the future out of Iowa, was in Seattle today for a top 30 visit. And Rob, they had a scout at his pro day. He had an individual pro day. They sent a scout to that they had communication with DeGene at the Combine as well. This feels like there might be a little bit of deja vu going on here. Second straight year with a stud secondary player from the Big Ten. Yeah, and if the Seahawks do, in fact, select Cooper DeGene, uh, I think that this would be a selection that a lot of people would question initially. I don't think that they would be questioning, given them once they get a couple of weeks into the season, because the kid's a playmaker, Corbin, you know this. I mean, his, his ability to line up virtually in every single spot in the, the back seven on defense at Iowa, a program that you and I are, are both just enamored with the way that Kirk Ferentz and his staff have been able to consistently produce NFL quality NFL players. And everybody's going to focus in on the defense defensive side of the ball and that's understandable yep. um, but I also think that his ability as a punt returner is critical here as well with the Seahawks losing DJ Dallas in free agency I think it's going to be interesting to see what they do not only at the punt returner but the kick returner position punt returner is the position I think that is going to absolutely skyrocket in value given the way that the NFL has changed their rules in terms of kick returns punt returns now are going to be really the playmaker on the special teams side of the field and that's one of the many areas in which Cooper DeGene absolutely starred for Iowa he had a punt return for a touchdown early in his career he had one stolen from him that could have won a game against Minnesota this past season but they they called that he did a you know you know Made, made the motion that he was calling for a fair catch. I think that was pretty questionable. You can look at it up for yourselves on YouTube. But the the tracking skills, the the instincts, the just the savviness that is Cooper DeGene, I think that it translates very well to the NFL in terms of defense, in terms of special teams. And I think that it's something that Mike McDonald, even though he only spent the one year, of course, at Michigan and Ann Arbor, 
Cooper DeGene was was a player that was on everybody's lips, basically in Big Ten football over the last three seasons. And so I think that if he is available to the Seahawks at number 16, if the Seahawks choose not to trade back from number 16, then he is one of the more fascinating I don't know if they even want to call it a wild card at this point. I think he has to be considered a legitimate contender for the Seahawks at number 16, but he is being projected by some as a bit of a wild card. I think that he would be a wild card that could pay off with a trip back to the playoffs for the Seahawks if he is indeed their selection. Anyone who listens to this podcast regularly knows that I am not going to use the term wild card with Cooper DeGene because I've been talking him up since late January before Mike McDonald got hired. And then when Mike McDonald got hired, you and I both see a potentially dynamic fit, putting him in this scheme as a safety where you can move him into the slot. He can play single high. He's got the instincts to immediately jump into any of these positions in the secondary. You could move him to the outside as a boundary corner if you wanted to rotate him and Devin Witherspoon, who can play inside. This is going to be a defense that is supposed to be built on, I don't want to use the word deception, but pre-snap disguises and catching quarterbacks off guard. And it's so much easier to do that when you have a number of guys in the secondary that not just are really good players and could do a number of different things are really good all around players, but can play multiple positions. And Cooper DeGene would be a guy that would immediately check off that box. And I've mentioned this several times. There is not a long-term safety on this roster right now, unless you believe Julian Love is going to get an extension before the season. I think the Seahawks want to see a little more before they do that. Last year, he made the Pro Bowl, but he was inconsistent, had a really rough start to the season. You want to see what he looks like this year. And then Rayshon Jenkins, he's basically on a one-year deal where there could be a second year if we feel like you earned it. And Kayvon Wallace and Love are both free agents next year. So this is a position group where they absolutely are going to be looking for that foundational piece. And Cooper DeGene is not Kyle Hamilton, but he does some things that Kyle Hamilton can't do. And he is one of those multifaceted playmakers that anytime he gets his hands on the football, he can return it for a touchdown. He did it three times in one year two years ago. And he's a great tackler too. That's the other reason that I'm bullish on him as a safety three missed tackles, his entire 2022 season. And he was in on a lot of stops at Iowa. This is a guy that loves to stick his head into the fight. He is just a really good football player. And we have seen John Schneider in the past. I don't expect this to change with the new head coach that he has been looking for those blue chip guys when he has the opportunity to get them. That's what Devin Witherspoon was to them last year. If you've got a chance to get Cooper DeGene, especially if you trade down and he's somehow still there, then again, this is not a wild card to me, Rob. This is a guy that I think is going to be very high on their big board. And now that he's at this top 30 visit, that just further shows this is a case where I don't think this is a smoke screen. I think this is clearly we like this kid a lot. We've already had communication with him, and he is high on our board, and he could be a guy that we can't pass up if he's available. And you can look at the issues they've got on the offensive line. This is a deep guard class. You're not going to find a Cooper Jean after the first round. No, you're not. And that's the thing is that, again, the positional versatility, the the playmaking skills. Uh, and I, lo- I love the fact that you mentioned his um, – you know, just the consistency as open field tackler. Uh, you know, going back to last year, Corbin, when, when the Seahawks had a cornerback and Reek Woolen that basically was not nearly the player in his second season that he was in his first season. And and Reek Woolen, I think, at the outside cornerback position is something that we got to talk about a little bit here because I really believe that Cooper DeGene is going to be viewed as a cornerback for a lot of scouts, perhaps a safety for a lot of scouts. And it's that ability to play both positions that to me is the most intriguing here for the Seahawks. Well, let's face it, the, the Seahawks are a quality team on paper, but also lack depth. And so I, I really believe that Devin Witherspoon legitimized his selection at number five overall because he was a terrific player for the Seahawks, playing both inside and out. But again, with Reek Woolen falling off the board and his biggest 
area of concern being just the open field tackling ability. One of the areas in which Cooper DeGene stars, I think that he could push Reek Wool. I think that he could push any of Seattle's safeties. As I mentioned before, he also could be your starter at the punt returner position. So it's the ability to play three different roles for the Seahawks immediately is one of the reasons why I think that this makes an awful lot of sense. And you threw out the, the very impressive number of three missed tackles um, and in 2022. I'll throw out another one. In 2023, zero touchdowns allowed. And so mm-hmm. people who are questioning whether Cooper DeGene can stay outside a cornerback, well, watch a little bit more tape. He wasn't beaten by anybody in the Big Ten this season. The go was beaten by very few each of the prior two seasons. Again, I think those are things that John Schneider is going to love. Mike McDonald's going to love it as well. Yeah, and I think you also, and I mentioned this a second ago, Rob, you have to look at every draft class. They're all unique. There's different position groups that have more depth. I don't feel like the safety position. Could you get some quality guys in a day too? Absolutely. We've talked about a handful of these guys. But to me, Cooper DeGene is the cream of the crop by a wide margin here, just in the sense of all the skills he brings to the table. And you can get starting caliber guards in this draft class on day two, maybe even early day three. That's the kind of depth that we're talking about at that position. So you can go out and get that best player available in the first round that you think is going to be a great fit for Mike McDonald's defense. You can get that done, and then you can turn around and you can address the offensive line, especially if you could trade down and get DeGene. That would be the perfect scenario here. So I'm just saying this. I've been saying it since January. I would not be surprised if Cooper DeGene ends up becoming a Seattle Seahawk. He might not be there when the Seahawks get to pick, though, and that's the downside of pick first round five there's a lot more teams that would have an opportunity to select and we shall see what happens when we come back it is mock draft monday and we are going to be taking a look at rob's annual all offense mock draft all seven selections going on the offensive side of the football don't go away you're listening to our latest edition of locked on seahawks This episode is brought your way by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. It's what brings the winning trophy, and it's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors is everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Whether you're looking for superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, whatever you're into, speed, power, style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts, For your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're going to be burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. You're listening to the latest Mock Draft Monday here on the Locked on Seahawks podcast. I'm your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined, as always, by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. And a special thanks to all the 12s out there. Thanks for tuning in and making Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week. It's one of our final Mock Draft Mondays. It's the penultimate Mock Draft Monday here on Locked on Seahawks. Not this Thursday, but the following Thursday, the draft will kick off in Detroit. And Rob, around this time of year, every year, you have the ability to post an all-offensive mock draft and an all-defensive mock draft that the Seahawks themselves publish on Seahawks.com. And I always find it to be a really interesting exercise, especially this year where I could see Seattle leaning very heavily on the defensive side of the ball to try to retool Mike McDonald's defense or heck. On offense, maybe Ryan Grubb says, hey, let's go all in on the offense. We'll win games with our offense. And we mentioned the term wild card last segment with Cooper DeGene. You and I both agree at this point. I don't know if that label really fits with him as far as being a prospect the Seahawks are looking at. But in this all offensive mock draft, I think you and I would agree that this is truly a wild card. The Seahawks would be taking number 16 that would probably have some fans dropping their jaw a little bit. It might. 
Um, but uh, I think that the ones that are going to be might be dropping their jaws might be the defensive players. They're trying to go up against a, a six foot eight, three hundred and forty pound man that is Amarius Mims, and and Corbin he plays at the right tackle position, and the Seahawks already have a quality player, of course, at that position, Abraham Lucas. But that's a quality player that missed eleven games a year ago, and there have been some concerns about his long term viability. I, I see a player in Abraham Lucas who also has the position, has the, the size, the physicality, the temperament to be able to slide inside to perhaps play that left guard position if the Seahawks do still consider that to be a position of concern. To me, Amarius Mims is one of those players that uh, just because of his almost freakish size and athletic ability that he warrants consideration at number 16 overall. And, you know, one of the things that I've tried to do in, in trying to get into inside of John Schneider's head over the years, I just kind of looked at history and in the 14 years in which he has been calling the shots for the Seahawks on draft day, he has selected zero uh, interior offensive lineman in the first round in all of his days with the Green Bay Packers. And he often cites Ron Wolf and the late great Ted Thompson as some yeah. of the, the people who kind of helped his decision making. They selected zero interior offensive lineman in the first round as well. With John Schneider in the past several years in Seattle, with, with Seattle, he has taken four offensive tackles, and a couple of them have moved inside. James Carpenter, Jermaine Fetted being two of them. So, Amarius Mims, if the Seahawks were to select the big 6'8", 340-pound redshirt sophomore from Georgia at number 16 overall, I think what that would suggest is that they feel that Abraham Lucas, or perhaps one of the free agents signed here recently, might be able to line up at that left guard position and, and take over for Damian Lewis. I really think a Marius Mims would be that kind of swing for the fences type of a selection that John Shiner has gone for in the past. Mike McDonald, of course, has had a great deal of experience in watching the Baltimore Ravens in the past go for big offensive tackles as well. It can provide some push. And so I think that that would make some sense here, basically killing two birds with one stone, the left guard and right tackle positions for the long term. Now, Switching over, while everybody is focusing in at the left tackle or at the, excuse me, the offensive line positions, to me, tight end is very much every bit a, a concern for the Seahawks. So that's why I think that if Brock Bowers were somehow to slide all the way down to number 16 overall, that's your selection. I mean, he's a terrific player. But Kate Stover in the third round, at this point, number 81 overall, I think is a beautiful consolation prize. This is a former defensive player. He actually started in the Rose Bowl a few years back against Utah as a linebacker, but he has become an exceptional tight end over the last couple of seasons. Won the Big Ten's tight end of the year award this past season. 6'4", 255 pounds, runs nicely, and has great quickness and physicality. I, I, he's a, To me, he's a bit of a bumper car with his ability to bounce off of contact. The Seahawks, as we talked about before, at the safety positions and off of uh, or the, at the guard positions, they don't have a great deal of depth at that spot when it comes past the 2024 season. They only have one tight end, Noah Fan, who is signed past 2024. So I think that Kate Stover basically resetting that positional group with a tight end selected early on would make an awful lot of sense. Switching over to the middle rounds, Anthony Gold, wide receiver, punt returner extraordinaire, was the punt all-American punt returner, led the entire country in punt return yards in 2022, and was almost as dynamic in 2023. Certainly was as dynamic at the East-West Shrine Bowl when he returned a punt. Corbin, it was a spectacular return. You probably have seen it. Maybe our listeners have not, but he, he catches the ball, does a full 360 turn while being being hit and is able to keep his balance and still accelerate the forward touchdown. To me, that is something that, as I mentioned before, I think that the Seahawks are looking for at the punt returner position, maybe why they might be considering a player like Cooper DeGene in the first round. I think an interesting spot is going to be at the quarterback position. I have Joe Milton, the quarterback from Tennessee, arguably the strongest arm quarterback in this draft class, available to Seattle at number 118 overall. I think that he would make some sense, especially considering the success that Ryan Grubb had with Michael Penix Jr., of course, uh, you know, at the University of Washington. So to me, 
He is somebody that is interesting. We'll talk about him a little bit more. Then quickly going through in, in round six and seven, Ladarius Henderson, offensive lineman for Michigan, has experience at left tackle as well as left guard. And then two former University of Washington standards, Jack, wa Jack Westover, excuse me, the tight end at number 192 overall. We've talked a lot about Jack Westover, but the running back Dylan Johnson, I mean, there's a lot of Husky fans out there, of course, Corbin, who know how physical and durable that, that Dylan Johnson was for the Huskies as an interior run plugger this past season. I love his hands out of the backfield as well. That's where he ex excelled uh, at Mississippi State. His previous three seasons 149 receptions in those three seasons with the late great Mike Leach at Mississippi State I think that that is something that fits into Seattle's offense you have three running backs currently on the roster some very young talented running backs but I also think that you want to give Kenny McIntosh a little bit of a push to be that number three back on this team and so to me Dylan Johnson can provide the the physicality that you're looking for to be a backup behind Zach Sharp as well as the savviness and pass protection, the soft hands as a receiver to be able to give the Seahawks truly a three down option with the seven round selection. To me, that is value as you can call it. Yeah, I like this mock draft overall. I think the only thing that I would have some questions about and not because of the process, as you explained, John Schneider has drafted four tackles in the first round over the years, has not drafted interior offensive linemen, but I think you and I, we have been under the assumption that if they were going to take a tackle in the first round, it would likely be somebody like a Troy Fotanu that you could slide him inside rather than Abraham Lucas. We have to remember, Rob, Abe Lucas has never played a down of guard in his entire football life. He's never played it in high school. He didn't play it at Washington State. And I'm not saying he couldn't do it, but especially coming off of that knee injury, I think that that would be quite a gamble if the Seahawks decided, you know what, we're going to bring in a tackle in Mims that has a really high upside. I get that part, but if you're planning to move Lucas inside, maybe it ends up working out. Maybe Scott Huff can make him an all-pro caliber guard. Who knows? But that would be the one pick here where I'm just wondering, is that something the Seahawks are going to do? If they bring in a tackle, I would think it's going to be somebody that they think can slide into guard rather than a 6'8 tackle who isn't going to be moving inside at that height. As far as the other picks, my favorite on the first four rounds, I love the Cade Stover pick. I have a late second round grade on him. I think he still has a lot of untapped upside. As you said, he was a linebacker only a few years ago. So he's still relatively new in the sense that he only played a couple of years at that position at Ohio State, but he was really effective. I think he's going to grow into his body and develop as a blocker. I think he can be an all-around tight end in the league. So if you can get him at 81, that's good value. And on day three, it'd be easy for me to say Jack Westover since I coached him. Of course, I would like to see him in a Seahawks uniform. But Dylan Johnson, as you mentioned, if you can get him at picks 235 in that 200 range, you can get him in the seventh round. I think that that is a really good value for a player that probably should be picked in the middle of day three in this running back class that doesn't really have any blue chips, but has a lot of really good players in the middle to late rounds that could be available. Dylan Johnson's not going to be a burner. He's not going to be a guy that hits a lot of home runs, but he is a really consistent between the tackles runner with excellent hands. So I really like those two picks, Stover and Johnson, the most as value picks. And a lot of these picks – they would definitely check off boxes that we've seen in the past from John Schneider in terms of the kind of players he's looking for, while also considering what this new coaching staff is going to be looking for as well. When we come back next, we just talked about Adarius Mims, a first-round candidate of the tackle position. Most likely, though, Seattle's going to be looking in the later rounds if they're wanting to reinforce depth at the tackle position. Rob and I are going to be looking at some day three sleepers to watch on the offensive line when we return here on our Monday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This episode is brought your way by Monopoly Go. I've been told I'm a competitive person. Rob, do you think that's true? I do. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, I do have a competitive side. We all do. And my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times, and I'm one of them. It's a great twist on Monopoly where you play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities 
that you bring big money with. But the best part is messing with my friends. I can charge them rent on my iconic properties, just like Classic Monopoly. But now I can also rob their vaults of riches for myself. And the leaderboards show me who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. But it's not just my competitive side that loves it. You can team up with friends and people all around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now for free on the App Store or Google Play. This episode is also brought to you away by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. You can bet on everything from Sidney Crosby slap shots to Vlad Guerrero Jr. home runs to Jason Tatum slam dunks. It's all on an app that is safe, secure, and super easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. You're listening to Mock Draft Monday here on the Locked On Seahawks podcast. This is your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined, as always, by my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. And a special thanks to all the 12s out there. Thank you, as always, for tuning in five days a week to Locked On Seahawks. Let's switch gears back to the 2024 NFL Draft. We just had Rob's all-offensive mock draft. We'll get to see his all-defensive mock draft at some point this week, but... We are now going to shift gears back to our prospect preview by position. And you just mentioned Darius Mims as a first-round target, which I've seen him mocked a few other people to the Seahawks as well. There may be some concern long-term about Abraham Lucas's health. That is something else to consider. But if the Seahawks are going to go with a tackle in this draft, common sense would maybe suggest that it's going to be later in the draft, especially after signing George Fant in free agency. They're going to have a healthy, hopefully healthy Abraham Lucas back as well as Charles Cross. And so let's dive into the day three tackles, because this seems like a sweet spot. And Rob, I know you've said this a few times, that this might be the deepest tackle class that you have seen in your time as a scout. So with that in mind, I'm going to let you have the first pick here on our day three tackles, who you think would be an interesting Seahawks four through seven. Well, I, I certainly appreciate that. And as you said, Corbin, I mean, in my entire time as a scout, I've been doing this for you know, 24 years at this point, and this is the best offensive tackle class in terms of frontline talent, in terms of depth I've ever seen. And I think the Seahawks would, frankly, and I don't use this word very often with the Seahawks, frankly, be foolish if they don't take advantage of the depth of this year's offensive tackle class. As I mentioned a couple of moments ago, I think there's a can I think there's a possibility that they go in the first round for an offensive tackle and perhaps move Abraham Lucas inside at guard or just try to look for an upgrade with a player like an Amarius Mims, 6'8, 340 pounds, 36 inch arms. I think that he can play right tackle. I also think that he could be left tackle, and that might be something that the Seahawks consider given that. Abraham Lucas, Charles Cross have played quality football, but have they proven all pro caliber players? Something to consider here. But if the Seahawks do go with a little bit more traditional approach, I think that there are the players available this year, Corbin, who would make some sense on day three. A player that I think would make some sense at you know, Seattle has the number 102 overall selection in the fourth round, um, it, it, as well as at 118. They're going to have two selections in the first 20 picks in the fourth round, and I really think that that is going to be a sweet spot of tackle. One of my favorites is Christian Jones, a six foot five, 305 pounder from Texas. He played primarily at the right tackle position for Texas, and Steve Sarkeesian, of course, who the Seahawks are going to have a great deal of familiarity with. He also has 13 career starts in the left tackle position. As I mentioned, 6'5", 305 pounds. He's got 35-inch arms. He ran a 5.04 second in the 40-yard dash. That's significant given that the way the Seahawks have prioritized offensive linemen in recent years that have spectacular 40-yard dash times. And to me, Corbin, one of the things that's most interesting about him 
48 games as a starter, including the last 45 consecutively. And so the durability, the consistency, the fact that he played his best football, his senior season goes to the senior bowl, has a strong week of performance there. To me, those are all the reasons why if the Seahawks don't go with an offensive tackle early, they definitely should come back on day three early and fortify that position, even with all the depth that the Seahawks have at that spot currently. We're going to bring some Red River rivalry madness into this podcast because I am now going to go with an Oklahoma tackle for my first selection here, looking at day three targets at tackle. Walter Rouse, a little different style player, six foot six, 313 pounds, kind of an athletic leaner build tackle and so you see that some in the run game from a negative perspective there are times where he has a tough time driving defenders off the ball but he's got pretty sticky hands and what I mean by that is he sustains blocks fairly well for a guy of his size not being the biggest tackle and you can see the athleticism in pass pro you got to be able to protect the quarterback in the air it out big 12 and I know both these teams are now going to the SEC but uh, Walter Rouse played a lot of games at the left tackle position. If he can play on the right side, which that's the question mark here, this is a guy that I think could make a ton of sense for the Seahawks on early day three with one of those two fourth round selections. I think he is a solid run blocker. Maybe not going to be a guy that's going to win a lot with the downhill game, but in zone blocking where he can use his lateral agility, his quickness, I think this is a guy that could develop into a really solid tackle in the NFL. And I also think there could be some potential with him, unlike Adarius Mims. I actually could see this being a player, even though he hasn't played the position that could potentially play the guard spot because he does have the lateral movement that you're looking for. And I think his pass pro would be even better playing in the phone booth at the guard spot. So this is a guy that you could maybe have some positional flexibility with as well. No, I I 100% agree with you. And that's one of the reasons why I really like Caden Wallace from Penn State. Similarly built as Walter Ross, as you just mentioned, in the case of Caden Wallace, he's 6'5", he's 314 pounds. Look, all of his starts were at the right tackle position at Penn State, but he's got a, a, a kind of a thick frame to him that I think suggests that he could play inside at the guard spot. Uh, And one of the things, again, as I mentioned before with Christian Jones, who was a 48 game starter, Caden Wallace was a 40 game starter. And it's not just the game starts because the big 10 is quality competition. Just think about the pass rushers that he had to face in practice at Penn state over the last couple of seasons, just this past year, Adisa Isaac and uh, of course, Chop Robinson, are, are, are two players that, in case of Chop Robinson, he might be a, a first-round section. Hell, he could be a wild card for the Seahawks number 16 overall. And so, to me, that is one of the reasons why. I think that Caden Wallace is a player that a lot, a lot of people are talking about, but I feel very confident is going to want to be in a fourth or fifth-round selection and a future starter in the NFL. I personally like him best at right tackle, but I do believe that he has the size and the, the functional power to be able to slide inside the guard as well. The next player that I'm going to be looking at, Michigan, obviously there's the ties with Mike McDonald, even though he's a defensive coach. He knows a lot of the guys on offense that were there in 2021 and now are coming into the NFL draft. And in the case of Carson Barnhart, you're talking about a guy that I think is strictly a right tackle. If he's going to be playing tackle the next level, maybe he's a player that could slide inside as well. He's got a little different skill set. If you want to play tackle at Michigan or you want to play tackle for Jim Harbaugh specifically at Michigan you better be what I call a knuckle knocker and you better be willing to get after it and knock people off the line of scrimmage and Barnhart can do that there's some old school tenacity to his game not the most athletic guy not a guy that I think as a tackle at the next level is necessarily going to have an easy time trying to deal with NFL speed. That's why playing inside could be the better fit. But Seattle had a virtual visit with him already this offseason. There looks to be some significant interest, not just from the Michigan ties, but he would bring some of that blue collar mentality, some of that attitude that this line, I don't necessarily has had enough of 
the last few years. They need somebody that can really be a grinder that's got that nasty edge to him. And Carson Barnhart can do that. The pass pro numbers were not overly impressive last year. I do think there's some athletic limitations for him. Again, that could slide him inside. But if you're looking for somebody that's going to be able to ignite your run game and could play fairly early coming out of Michigan, the premier program last year at college football, uh, Carson Barnhart's a guy middle of day three in that five, six range. They've got a couple sixth round picks. I could see Barnhart being somebody that could make a lot of sense for the Seahawks at that stage of the draft. No, I, I could as well. Barnhart's a good football player. He's not quite as polished, in my opinion, as Javon Foster, the last offensive tackle I'm going to be mentioning yep. here. 6'6, 313 pounds, Corbin. This is, uh, you know, 39 consecutive starts, the left tackle position, uh, 41 starts overall against SEC competition. I like him as a swing tackle, but also think, again, as I mentioned before with Caden Wallace, is kind of a beefy guy. I think that he could be able to slide inside to guard. We're at a 5.30 with the 40-yard dash. The Seahawks have prioritized guys that are in the – 5.10 and below in the 40 yard dash of their tackle positions. So again, Javon Foster, Foster, all of his college starts were at the tackle positions, played the senior bowl at that spot as well. I think that he might slide inside a guard. And in the fourth, fifth round, I think that he would be an excellent value pick for the Seahawks at their spot at that spot as well. We've looked at a bunch of Power 5 prospects, which again, that's what John Schneider has tended to prefer. They draft a lot of players from those Power 5 conferences, particularly the Big 12, the SEC, and the Big 10. I want to swing to the FCS level for my last player here, though. Anim Donkwa from Howard, the Bison. And some may be wondering, what have you seen that could have possibly made Donkwa worth listing on here because of where he played at? But I watched him play against a Big, Skin, Big 10 school a few years ago in Northwestern, Rob, and he had a really impressive game going up against Big Ten competition. And this guy is a massive human being. I mean, we, we throw that word around a lot with these offensive linemen. He is massive compared to other offensive linemen. He's 6'8", 350 pounds, and he ran – his 10-yard split is really what I'm intrigued by. He had a 1.77-second 10-yard split at 6'8", 350 pounds. This guy has really rare movement skills, and you can see it on film. Now, there's some times that he looks like he's disadvantaged against faster rushers, and I think some of that has to do with his technique. He's going to need to be coached up, jumping from FCS, Howard, to the NFL. And yet, I look at Donkwa being a player. If we're really looking for a player with a high ceiling, which that's what you're looking for with those late-round picks. You're taking stabs in the dark looking for guys that have traits that you can develop. Donkwa has as many traits to work with as any tackle that could be available in day three. So I think if the Seahawks can get him in the sixth or seventh round, uh, Neem Donkwa would be a player that I think would be really fascinating as a project tackle to work with Scott Huff, who has had his best success working with tackles. He's got two of them that could go in the first 40 picks this year out of the University of Washington. As always, you can follow me on X at Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Rob at Rob Rang. Make sure to follow Locked on Seahawks on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast to make sure you don't miss a single episode. But we come back tomorrow. We're going to switch gears to the all-defensive mock draft from our good friend Rob Rang. And we're going to look at what defensive player is going to be coming to the Seattle Seahawks. Make sure that you are listening in. Enjoy the rest of your Monday. Go Hawks.